I would say I make an effort for it to be informed by my geographical location. So maybe my natural tendency, uh, like growing up reading books and trying to stay in the house, that kind of thing, would just be the sort of psychic landscape, the um, interior world. So I do make myself as an exercise inside of my poems, like pay attention. So that means if I get on the bus today, I'm gonna be looking for poems. That makes me look on the bus. But otherwise I would get on it and I have my earphones in and I'd be composing sort of almost with my eyes closed. So places do show up because I make it just kind of a practice of a way of paying attention. So like, let me write a poem about this bus ride or this walk through the neighborhood. You know, they don't always become published. People don't always see them. Sometimes they do become poems, but it's just a way to make sure I'm paying attention to the landscape, you know, make sure I'm paying attention to where I'm walking. Um, so it would be very conscious a lot of the time. The flaneur, I can now know if I'm saying it right, it's F-A-F-L-A-N-E-U-R. It's a term Baudelaire came up with, which mm -hmm. is like the walker, the city walker. The flaneur is like an urban pedestrian sort of person that is paying attention. And so that's just so conducive. I think Wordsworth talks about that too. Uh, walking being just really conducive to certainly a poet's way in the world, maybe any writer's way in the world. So that's what's good about New York. I mean, when I'm home or in, when I'm in the South, and it's like, it's just not enough to see. I walk about a block and I've seen everything I'm gonna see. I'm not gonna interact with the bunch. But the walking desire is still there. But again, I'm more likely to be in my head if I'm walking in the countryside. I don't think I'll pay attention to trees so much, but they might show up more. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So again, I, I think that, that uh, the practice of just being someplace where you can walk is, uh, I mean, Mary Oliver would say that too. She mostly walked on the beach. But the practice of being somewhere where you can walk is conducive, I think, to just trying to be a poet in the world. So yeah, New York's great for that because you can walk lots of blocks and see lots of things. But, but maybe any major city would be like, any city where you can walk for 30 minutes um, and be engaged is a good place to be. Well, Pittsburgh has an interest in sort of artistic history just because of someone like August. Certainly, if you're like a black writer in Pittsburgh, you have to think about how that place makes someone like him. And if you're an artist, Andy Warhol. So I just think that, I mean, even New York, it's harder to kind of get that particular in terms of like artistic visions of the place that you're in and then deciding where you fit on that spectrum, if you follow me. If you're in the South, it's just like, well, a relationship with the natural world. That's Faulkner, that's anybody that spent some time in the South. So for Pittsburgh, for me, man, it was just an ideal kind of incubating place because it did seem to me to have a very tangible uh, literary and artistic history. So like this dude, Philip Pearlstein, who, if he's still alive, he's probably like a thousand years old. But he's from Pittsburgh. He was a contemporary of Andy Warhol. And even, as I say, even in most few years, I think he got to his 90s. I think he might still be alive. I knew about him because I studied art in college. And uh, Raymond Saunders, another painter. So my relationship to Pittsburgh, uh, this is not, it's a bigger statement. My relationship to Pittsburgh as an artist was very clear that I knew that there had been artists that were Mayor Bearden that had come out of it. So I was like, okay, this is a place you can be an artist. And in my other relationship with it was through sports. Like I had a friend who played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. His name was Willie Williams. And then a year or two later, um, Willie was a year ahead of me in high school. And then this other guy, uh, uh, Lethon Flowers, was a year behind me. And they both wound up playing for the Steelers in my time there. So that too was like, I had another kind of dynamic with this sort of sports history that seemed like not typical to any other place I had been in. Maybe a few college towns like OSU, but. So again, there was, for me, there was just a full palette of things that were gonna make it feel like it was a livable place, which is all I wanted. I mean, I can't say I ever like thought explicitly that I'd be writing books for my life. I thought I might teach, you know, and I was like totally fine with that. High school, undergrad, but because I had just come up, like my parents didn't go to school, um, if I hadn't gotten a basketball scholarship, I wouldn't have gone either. It was just mysterious to us how that worked. Even like getting uh, getting loans and things were sort of bizarre to us. We just didn't know what that was. So I went to college, I played basketball, and when I got my college degree, I was like, I'm I'm good. Like I'm the first person in my of my grandmother's children to have a college degree. So I'm ready to begin my life. And then, you know, a teacher was like, well, send out a few of the things you've been working on, these poems, maybe apply to a few art schools, and just see what happens. And 
the thing that I tell my students is that, yeah, you can do that no matter what your life has been. If you apply to write poems and somebody lets you do that without any kind of deep cost, you should do that. Even if you're like 80 years old and somebody came to you and said, I want you to come to Pittsburgh for three years, we'll give you a fellowship and all you got to do is write poems and then maybe you can teach you know, poetry after about two years in that place. Like anybody on the planet, even if you can't write poems, if somebody pays you to write poems, you should say. I just, man, I try not to have any real theories about how one writes or what one writes, what those circumstances are, if you got to be married or not married, yeah. live in the woods, live in the city. I just sort of think like it's just a practice that you want to maintain. So the thing is, like, if you say you're married with two kids and you're writing poems, those poems should somehow reflect that life. If you suddenly live on an island by yourself, then look at it as an opportunity to write a new kind of poem. So I, I do think of the poems as being more responsive to like your environment rather than looking for this ideal environment in which to write poems, you know? So for me, I'm always interested in like how changes, how disruptions and things, even like, I mean, I don't even think of myself as having um, writer's block because I think like this, but even the notion of writing writer's block to me is interesting because you're like, oh, I wonder what I'll write after writer's block. That could be interesting. So maybe sure. a little writer block, writer's block would be good. A break would be good. You see what I mean? But I write all the time because I don't care. I just say like, you know, whatever it is, I'm on a plane. I got to like, nope. Mm, I just had an idea. Write that one down. Sometimes I lose stuff and I'm like, well, you know, if it was a good idea to come back to me. So the practice of just constantly trying to capture the thoughts that run through your head, um, that's the important thing for me. So I don't really, I don't even compare Pittsburgh and New York. Yeah. I think I was one kind of poet in Pittsburgh and I'm another kind of poet in New York. And even on a certain day, I was one kind of poet on Sunday and I'm another kind of poet on Monday or on Saturday. And I rely on that because that is the life. I mean, you know, if I was a monk, which I think could be interesting too, you know, then I think those would be fairly stable, maybe consistent poems, although I guess, you know, monks get sad sometimes too. So you are just trying to track some frequency, track, you know, a practice of frequency, whatever you think frequency means, uh, noun, verb, whatever, adjective. I still think of the practice being the thing that really gets you going. So, and I sell it, you know, I mean, I say at this point, um, I always live like this, but it was harder to kind of convince people that you know, just maintaining a practice and not thinking about like being on Twitter or thinking about prizes or even thinking about books, just thinking about poems. Like, I mean, I think I can convince people now at my age if that's right, but even 10 or 15 years ago, it was debatable. Like, oh man, you should really be on Twitter or you should really make sure you do this or do you really want to write poems with the same titles? I mean, some of the things that I can do, you know, based on that, that policy, I think it's only time that's shown that like maybe it's not wrong to think about poems and not poetry, you know?